FM 102's Traffic and Travel. There are enormous numbers of people going to witness this eclipse. On the Lizard, all the car parks are full. Pirate FM 102, breaking the news in Cornwall and West Devon. Those car parks are now full and there are hundreds of campers too. It's August the 11th, 1999, and thousands of people in Cornwall are preparing to witness a total solar eclipse. I've come all the way from Oldham and I think it's worth coming all the way to watch the eclipse. I've come from the States, from California. Not very far. <laughs> from our ride. From the States, uh, Denver, Colorado. I've come right from West London. It's a rare and very special event because although it's nine o'clock in the morning, over the next couple of hours the sun is going to gradually disappear. Eclipse experts are getting ready to monitor changes in the atmosphere using high-tech telescopes to follow the whole event. Younger scientists are setting up all sorts of investigations. Others are just here for the view. Because it's too dangerous to look at the sun directly, this group of spectators are wearing glasses with specially designed filters. There's a growing sense of excitement. The amount of light has been gradually falling over the past two hours. Then suddenly the crowd is plunged into a spooky darkness. A gap in the clouds breaks just in time to see the sun. It looks as if it's disappearing. So why is it so dark? What's happened to the sun? In ancient times, sudden darkness in the middle of the day was bewildering. Each civilization had its own explanation. All around the world, legends talk of monsters eating the sun. From big cats in Argentina, giant frogs in Vietnam, to dragons in China. In ancient China, they tried to frighten the dragon away by shooting arrows into the air. But in North America, the Chippewa Indians fired flaming arrows because they thought the sun needed relighting. In ancient Europe, two tribes had been fighting for five years. When darkness suddenly fell in the middle of the day, they saw it as a sign and immediately ended their war. Hooray! No more battles! Hooray! You were so brave. Would you care to dance? But perhaps the best story belongs to the people of Tahiti. They thought the sun and moon were very much in love and that the only time they could touch was during an eclipse. So, what's actually happening? The reason the sun seems to be disappearing is because the moon is passing in front of it. The moon gradually stops the sun's light from reaching Earth. In a total eclipse, the moon blocks out the sun completely. It's a perfect fit. Daylight returns as the moon continues its journey in front of the sun. Really good. That was scary. <laughs> oh, I thought it was great. <laughs> Weird. The clouds just cleared momentarily right during the moment of the diamond ring effect. And so uh, you can hear, you can see it there. And uh, just, just a moment of the corona we got to see it and that's me screaming oh yes so it was a teaser but the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon so how can the moon possibly block it out it's all to do with distance 
This bead is our model moon. This is our model sun. To show how something this small can cover up something this big, we need a wide open space. Carl is the Earth. He holds the moon 25 centimetres away from his eye. So how far away do Shanae and Alicia need to hold the sun for it to be the same size as the moon? 20 metres! No! 50 metres! No! 100 metres! Yes! Because the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, Shanae and Alicia need to hold it 400 times further away. At this distance, the moon and sun appear to be exactly the same size. The moon can completely cover up the distant sun. A total eclipse is an amazing coincidence. Despite the differences in their size, the moon and sun are just the right distance apart. The sun is 150 million kilometres away from the Earth. The moon orbits the Earth once a month. For a total eclipse to happen, the Earth, moon and sun need to line up exactly. In this position, the moon blocks out some of the sun's light, so a shadow falls on our planet. This is because light always travels in straight lines and it can't pass through the moon. Only a small area directly behind the moon is in total darkness. As the moon moves, this shadow travels across the Earth. Viewed from space, you can see it sweep across. So, where do you need to stand to experience total darkness? Without light, we can't see. In the dark, the only way this burglar sees anything is when the torch beam falls on it. But with only a small amount of light, we never see the whole picture. Switch more lights on. And what we thought was a cosy living room is in fact a furniture showroom. So how does light enable us to see our surroundings? In the past, people came up with a variety of explanations. A thinker in ancient Greece called Plato thought an inner fire produced rays of light that shot out of your eyes, touching anything in view. But surely that would mean having eyes like car headlights. Others thought we could see because rays of light hit our eyes first and then bounced off onto objects in view. But much later, an Arab scientist called Al Hazam noticed that when you look at something bright, it hurts. He realised that light must be entering the eye, not leaving it. Ooh. It hits the object first, and then your eyeball. <laughs> the torch enables our burglar to see anything that light falls on. Light travels from the bulb. Some of it hits the object and reflects off into the burglar's eye. Once light reaches the eyes, signals are sent to the brain. The brain interprets this information and the object becomes visible. All this takes just a split second. Some objects and surfaces can reflect light better than others. 
What materials are best at reflecting light? Everything you can see is bouncing light back at you. Some surfaces bounce light back so well that you can see a reflection. Smooth surfaces like glass, polished metal and a pool of still water are all good reflectors. Perhaps the best reflector of all is a mirror. Using a mirror, a dancer and a television camera, we can investigate how light is reflected. Positioned here, the camera can't see the dancer's reflection, but look what happens as the camera moves. The dancer eventually appears. Her reflection is only visible from certain camera positions. Now you see her, now you don't. But why? To work it out, we need to know a bit more about the science of reflection. First, you need a narrow beam of light. Place a mirror in its path and the light changes direction. It's reflected. Change the single beam to three parallel beams and see what happens. Light bounces off a mirror in a very regular way. The ray of light approaching the mirror is called the incident ray. The one leaving the mirror is the reflected ray. Imagine drawing a line at right angles to the mirror where the beam strikes it. The angle between this line and the incident ray is the angle of incidence. The angle between this line and the reflected ray is the angle of reflection. So, what happens when the beam is moved? For each ray of light, the angles of incidence and reflection are always the same size. Light doesn't bounce off the mirror at just any old angle which is why the dancer's reflection isn't always visible. Rays of light bounce off the dancer in all directions, but only some hit the mirror. Any light hitting the mirror reflects at a certain angle. Stand in this area and the light bouncing off the mirror enters the camera. Stand outside this area and none of the light from the dancer is reflecting towards it. To make the dancer visible, the camera has to move. Light and mirrors can also be used to play tricks. If we promise there's no camera trickery, how can so many objects be pulled out of the box?
Can you spot the mirror? How can a bodiless head appear on the table? Of course, the magician knows it's just a trick of the light. Two mirrors carefully angled under the table make you think there's nothing under it at all. When in fact, they're hiding a space where our magician's assistant can sit, ready to push anything through a hole cut in the table top. Light has been used for centuries to send coded messages. But relying on light travelling through air has its problems. Obstacles get in the way. And if it's foggy, the light doesn't travel very far. But believe it or not, light is still an important part of modern day communications. Hello, how can I help you? Telephones, fax machines, the internet, they all rely on light. That's because light doesn't just travel in air, it can pass through all sorts of materials. This is a laser, a very narrow beam of light. Shine it through water and it easily passes straight through. Change the position of the laser and the beam is reflected off the surface back into the tank. Change the tank into a stream of water and see what happens. The light travels through the curved path of the stream. It's reflected many times inside the water. The same thing happens in a curved piece of glass. You can see the light's path as it bounces along. The thin glass fibres of this lamp work on the same principle. Inside this optic cable are thousands of extremely fine glass fibres. Flash a light at one end and no matter how curved the cable is, the light message gets through. Cables like this are used in modern telecommunications. Information is carried in optic fibres as coded light messages travelling at high speeds over vast distances. When else is it useful to bend light around corners? <laughs> 